Hello. <laughs> That'll do it. Good morning, Wyatt Park. Before I start the announcements, somebody with a Toyota Camry left their keys in the social hall. Nope. Well, we'll I'll lay them on the table. You'll know it later. Okay. <laughs> okay, then. There we go. You're welcome. Well, we're going to start with the connect cards. If you are new to Wyatt Park Christian Church and you would like us to connect with you about baptism, becoming a member, or getting involved in a ministry, please fill out these lovely purple cards that are in the back of the pews. When you do that, you may put it in the communion offering plate, after communion in the offering plate, or you may hand it to one of the greeters or one of the ministers. Also, children's time follows um, communion. Children's ages three through third grade are welcome to join Tanya in the back of the sanctuary. They'll have their own Bible lesson and activity. Vacation Bible School is coming, and there's still time to sign up your family. If you'd like to sign up your kids and their friends, you may do that either here in the church or go online on our website or on our Facebook event page. Following that will be the Family Fishing Day on Sunday, June 23rd at Duncan Park in Savannah from 4 until 7. It'll be an afternoon of fishing and activities. And if you would need a ride for that event, you may contact Pam in the church office and her email is in the church bulletin. Also be aware of other announcements that are in the church bulletin. And now let's stand together and join our voices in worship.
moment out of what might be our otherwise busy lives and turn our eyes to the fact that we have a God who is ever present so that when we do misspeak and say things that don't make sense, you are there with us. And as we go out into the world, and maybe we sometimes just lose our way a little bit, that we have a light that brings us back. You are so incredible in the ways that you so completely love us, in the ways that you allow us to be your people here on earth and shine your light as we reflect the grace and the goodness that comes from having a father that just runs right after his people. So thank you for that. Thank you for all of the salvation and mercy that you so willingly bestow upon us. Thank you for giving us moments where we can restart our weeks and restart our brains and our lives and recalibrate towards what it means to be your people. I am so, so grateful that you bring us here every week and that you bring us into community and you are such a good, good father. And it is in your most precious name that we pray. Amen. everyone. Our scripture today comes from Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting.
on this Memorial Day weekend Sunday, we've printed out in the bulletin a list of our beloved friends, church members over the last year that have passed away, and in just a minute, I'm going to read off those names, and then Mark is going to uh, chime the organ, one chime for each name, but I also want to direct your thoughts towards um, those people throughout the history of our country who uh, paid it all in the way of sacrifice, um, who lost their life overseas, lost their life in a campaign. Uh, be in, in prayer, be mindful for their family members who today uh, hold and carry those scars and those, those hurts that miss a loved one. And so let's just start off here today just with a moment of silence on this Memorial Day, giving thanks to God for um, people who live their lives without regard to their own well-being, but put others before themselves. And then after that moment of silence, I will read those names, followed by the chimes. Let us have a moment of silence. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the lives of these saints, for Bud Solansky, Bob Blythe, Minnie Lou Ray, Shirley Estes, Bill Maxwell, 
John Lawrence, Allie Ray, Ron Dowden, Hazel Anderson, Naomi Lindstrom, Marsha Rogers. Sorry, that was te wasn't technology, that was human error. And I guess my school teacher voice didn't reach to the back. It is well with our souls. And during these times of anxiety, whether it be minor or as your refrigerator going out, or something that is major as we think about how we're anxious for things in our lives. I thank God for each one of you that are in this pew today. You could have been anywhere, but here you are, worshiping and praising our Lord and God. So it is well with our souls. I'd like to begin the prayer time with words of Nancy Mercer Riley reminding us of the hope that we have. And when we finish these words, there will be a time of silence for you to lift up your personal concerns that are dear to your heart. And then I will continue the prayer. Come, Lord Jesus, let the rushing mighty wind of your spirit come today, filling waiting hearts, burning hate away. Let the cloven tongues of love fill us with your peace. Pour out your spirit upon us, giving fears release. May our hearts rejoice with gladness, our tongues with praise this sing, that our flesh may rest in hope, because we know the King. Let us receive with gladness your sweet and holy word, May morn and noon and evening our prayers be heard. May we share from one to another the possessions you have given, joining our glad songs of praise and joyful righteous living. Gracious God, all-knowing Father, we praise you for loving us and lavishing us with grace. All we have comes for you, from you, and we are grateful that you love us so much and sent your Son to save us and accepting us where we are. We do stand in the need of prayer daily. This Memorial Day weekend, we do remember those that gave of their lives, their ultimate sacrifice that you and I have 
freedom every day. We are grateful for all who have served and those that are serving at this time. May your peace, provision, and strength fill their lives. We also remember the loved ones that have gone before us, our cloud of witnesses. Holy Spirit, go before us, beside us, and through us as God brings peace, comfort, and healing for each person's concerns, whether it be health, grief, employment, financial, emotional, spiritual needs, according to his will. We are grateful for your answered prayers. Help us to joyfully be the ears and eyes, hands and feet of Jesus to others as we make and grow disciples of Jesus. Let us join together in praying the Lord's Prayer using debts and debtors. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I will attempt to light the candle on this Lord's table representing the Holy Spirit's presence. As we meet at his table, I thought about the significance of tables. Growing up, the table was the center of our household. That's where we argued, where we prayed, where we had our meals, completed homework, projects, helped with the canning of the vegetables and the rendering of the meat and packaging that we butchered on the farm, games. And so today, it continues with our family that our table is centered of our home, and especially the table that we have when we come to worship together, that we are here at the Lord's table. The Lord's table represents the Exodus 12 Passover meal in remembrance of the Israelites' freedom. Before the tenth plague, the Israelites were instructed to paint the doorpost and the top of the door with blood from a lamb that they would eat so that the death angel would pass over their homes. This is the meal that Jesus celebrated with his disciples. Shall we pray? Dear Lord, as we approach this table, we come humbly before you, recognizing the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify the spread and fruit of the vine, and let them be for us the body and blood of Christ. May this communion strengthen our faith, deepen our love for you and for the one another, and renew our spirits. Help us to remember the great cost of our salvation and live in gratitude for your grace. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Here at Wyatt Park, we have what's called open communion, which means that if you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're welcome to partake at the Lord's table. It belongs to him. How we do it is we form two lines and come down the center aisle, and as you come by the servers, they will place a piece of bread in your hand if you prefer gluten-free, it will be in the center of this table. And as you uh, see that there are a cup 
that you may dip in, or there's going to be individual cups that you may partake of on the pedestal. As you return to your seats, you will notice the offering plates in the front of the first row. This is another form of worship. We are asked to give back a portion of the gifts God has given us. Everything is his already. But when we give back to God, we're honoring him with it. As we remember the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples gathered in an upper room someplace in Jerusalem. It was the Passover. They were having a meal together, and Jesus took bread. And as he gave it to him, and blessed it and broke it and gave thanks for it. And he said, this is my body. Take this bread and eat it in remembrance of me. When we eat and then the, took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant, the new relationship in my blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink it, all of you in remembrance of me. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We join with Christians here around the world as well as through the ages in proclaiming that we believe about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the mystery of Christ. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again.
try this one more time otherwise I'm going to consider this manna from heaven but this is a 2018 Toyota Camry that was in the social hall is anyone missing keys to a 2018 Toyota Camry Bobby it, no <laughs> well, all right we're gonna keep this but if anybody knows I was gonna say yeah appreciate that Cindy retires and I get a, I get a new car so this is wow if anyone needs it, if you hear of someone that's looking for car keys, I have them. I have a feeling somebody's going to be in a tizzy here in just a little bit. So, um, okay, and I'm just going to put this down here on the front pew. And in the meantime, kids are dismissed to go off to their children's time if they would like to. And uh, today we're starting a summer message series called Sunday Toppings, and this is largely driven by you, the congregation, some topics and scriptures that you have uh, presented to me, and there's still some Sundays available, so if you have a scripture or a topic that you'd like for me to consider in some way, feel free to email me. My information's in the bulletin, and I'd love to um, spend a Sunday talking about things that are on your thoughts and on your mind. And um, so we're going to be turning here in the scriptures to Matthew chapter 6 today, so I'll invite you to turn there. As you're turning to Matthew 6, uh, just a quick announcement about this upcoming Saturday, we have a, a fundraiser opportunity for the new generation singers, for New G. It's their trivia night, uh, June 1st, doors open at 5.30, the event starts at 6 p.m. Uh, if you just want to show up as an individual, it's $20, but if you want to round up a table of of eight, uh, each table is $100. So um, feel free to come on out. There'll, there's there's going to be a silent auction as well on, uh, on that evening. So just a wonderful way to celebrate New G and their ministry among us and among Ashland as well. Um, also, just uh, one more reminder too, at the end of the service, if you are a member of the church, we're going to have a quick, um, we have our ballots for our, our new nominations for our church officers. And so right after service, our nominating committee will hand out those ballots. We'll just ask you to fill those out and then return it. If you're not a member of the church, you can head on out after service. But if you are a member, just stick around right after service. Okay, so Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. We're going to read that here in just a minute. But today's topic, the first topic, is overcoming anxiety. And you'll, you'll see I'm sitting in a chair today. I'm not standing up because I think... And talking about anxiety and some of the topics we're going to talk about over the next couple of weeks, I don't want this to be me talking to you and telling you what to do or telling you how to think about things. I want this to be a, we're sitting down together, and even though you're not physically talking back to me, I want this to feel a little more like we're talking about this together, about overcoming anxiety. This past week on social media, I put out a poll of what are some of the things that make you most anxious. And I had a list of about 15 things, and I asked people to give me their top seven out of those 15 things. And I also gave a space for people to write their own things, whatever things make them anxious. And the top seven factors that people voted on for things that make them anxious are as, as follows. Uh, number one was health concerns. That was number one. And number two came in very closely behind that, and that was finances. Three, uh, degradation of Christian, godly morals in society. 
War and violence here and abroad came in at number four. Politics, corrupt politicians came in number five, and I assume that would have happened whether it was an election year or not, probably. Six, the polarization and divide of people via ideological extremes. And then the seventh was the decline of Christianity in the United States. Uh, church attendance, people who claim to be Christian, things like that. So that was the top seven. And then all of the others beyond that, we had eight was the economy. Uh, number nine was a tie between my relationships, personal relationships, and the pace of technological advances and how they are changing us and our world. So that, those came in at nine. Ten was the breakdown of the family. And that can be seen in all sorts of different ways, whether divorce, uh, single parent families, absent fathers, absent mothers. 11 was raising my children or raising my grandchildren. 12 was job or career concerns. And then 13 and 14, we have poverty, starvation, disease, natural disasters here and abroad. And then uh, number 14 was you know, climate change. So those were all of the, the things that I listed out as these are probably some things that make us anxious. And it's interesting in the top seven, the first two were all about like hitting close to home, talking about health concerns and finances. Those were the top two. And then everything else from that point on, especially in the top seven, was really about big sort of things, big topics, things that are outside of our homes, things that are happening outside of our control, and we really don't have a lot that we can do to fix those things. So thinking about anxiety, what makes you anxious? Let's read Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the year. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all of these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of God, and it's for the people of God. We are living in an ever-increasing time of anxiety, and it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it doesn't matter how well-educated you are or how much people like you. To be human is simply to be a person who wrestles with anxious thoughts. Forbes magazine did some research, and they cited some different sources within the medical Field, and they say that anxiety disorders, specifically here in America, in the United States, account for about 40 uh, million people. About 19% of the population here in the United States um, have some sort of what we would say an anxiety disorder. And within that 40 million people, within that 19% of the population, you can break that down into differing kind of severities, basically. Uh, for some people, anxiety is, is just a debilitating thing. And for other people, they would just say, yes, I have an anxious moment every once in a while. I have an anxious day every once in a while. But we all face anxious moments. And so here's one of the questions is, what are some of the contributing factors to the anxiety that we face 
as humans? I'd say the first one is TMI, which stands for too much information. Some experts, and this comes from Forbes magazine, they say some experts believe that anxiety is so common in the U.S. today because of how much information we receive on a daily basis. We are having trouble understanding what we need to react to and what information we can simply just let go of. Have you noticed that about yourself? Maybe you have all of these sources of information and it's hard for us to sift through what can I let go of and what do I actually need to react to. An overload of information can then lead to sort of this information fatigue for us which can result in a sort of a loss of motivation because it leaves us feeling unsure of how to respond to all of these different things that are causing us anxiety. Uh, so the first thing is, is TMI. Too much information could be one factor that leads to anxiety. Uh, another factor, uh, number two, would be having a superhero complex. And this kind of follows after the too much information in, in a neat and tidy way. Nowadays, when we think of technology that has changed the world, if I was to ask you, what is the, the piece of technology that changed the world the greatest? Some of you might think, well, it would be the internet, personal computers, cell phones. And, and I think in, in a way, we could, we could say each one of these has changed the world in a great way. But author and, and social critic, Neil Postman, uh, he's written some fabulous books if you want to nerd out on these kinds of things. Neil Postman argues that the technology that has marked the most fundamental shift in American culture that has only been amplified with every new invention is this, the telegraph. The telegraph is what Neil Postman says is the thing that has changed the world, specifically America, more than any other technology. Now, we know all about the, the telegraph here in St. Joe, don't we? We're proud of the Pony Express. You remember the history of the Pony Express and really what was the downfall? What was the ending of the Pony Express? Here's a quote that I found this past week from the National Pony Express Association for anyone that is not aware of that history. On June 16th, 1980, about 10 weeks after the Pony Express began operations, Congress authorized a bill to subsidize a transcontinental telegraph line to connect the Missouri River and the Pacific Coast. This resulted in the incorporation of the Overland Telegraph Company of California and the Pacific Telegraph Company of Nebraska. So the flow of information before the telegraph was much slower, okay? I mean, that's, that's just a given. We weren't inundated, our ancestors weren't inundated with the knowledge of problems and issues from across the country and around the world as quickly or as often. And so thus, problems that needed to be addressed or fixed were more local and close to home. The, one of my favorite authors right now, his name is John Mark Comer. He's an author in California. He was a pastor up until recently. He says this about the invention of the telegraph. He says, before the telegraph, when you were exposed to bad news, it was normally in your actual community, where you had some modicum of influence to do something about it. Does that make sense? So before the telegraph, if you received bad news, chances are that bad news was happening right there in your local town or county. Now, John Mark Comer goes on to use this illustri illustration. He, he, kind of this idea of, let's say, it's the middle of the night, you hear a commotion outside of your house, and you realize, after seeing your neighbors rushing in a certain direction, you see a glow of fire and smoke, you get up out of bed out of the middle of the night in your western pajamas, as he says, and you realize that your neighbor's barn has caught on fire. That, that would have been like bad news right then, right there, and you wouldn't at that point get out your phone and put a post on social media saying thoughts and prayers for, for neighbor Joe whose barn is on fire. He says, at that point, if, if you see Joe's barn is on fire, you're getting up out of bed, 
You're filling as many water buckets as you had, and you're going to help put out the fire with your neighbors, right? Now, that's an era that is long gone and, and long past. But then after the fire was out and Joe, Joe's barn was, you know, maybe demolished, uh, you then came together as a community to help Joe rebuild his barn, right? And so John Mark Comer says this is kind of pre-telegraph, and then the telegraph comes, and all of a sudden we're made aware of so many more things and issues and problems that are outside of the sphere of our influence and our ability to really do anything about it. So in this area of communication, we are exposed to bad news nonstop, and we are powerless to do anything about most of that bad news. And herein lies the problem, because we so badly want to help. We so badly want to do something. We have solutions in our mind for this and that. We have opinions over every tragedy, over every disaster, every, over every act of evil, and it's just become too much for us to handle. We've tried to become like God in our knowledge of all things. We've overestimated our ability to carry the weight of the knowledge of good and evil all around the world, and we, I would argue, are worse off for it. For some of us, the only thing that we can do in the face of bad news and tragedy is feel anxious. And we've grown, if we're, if we're honest, we've grown comfortable feeling anxious as if that is our primary duty. If that's the best thing that we can do to help out, sometimes we feel like in our anxiousness, this is my proper response. Anxiety has become our response to the things that need to be fixed that we have no power to fix ourselves. Author Jody Picoult says this, anxiety is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but it doesn't get you very but at least it feels like we're doing something in the face of bad news by feeling that anxiety and entertaining that anxiety. So that's number two is sort of this superhero complex could lead to sort of our anxiety. The third factor that I want to mention that sort of leads to a sense of anxiety for us is the digitization of the society. This is a loss or a diminishing of flesh and blood communication, friendship, or community in exchange for virtual friends, in exchange for social media friends and constant scrolling or swiping, whichever, whichever one you, you do with your device. The architecture, if you think about the architecture of our modern homes over the last 80 years, tells the story of this digitization of society. We, we had this slow evolution from a connection with our neighbors on the front porch and in our driveways to hiding from our neighbors in our garages and in our backyard with our big, beautiful privacy fences. Our streaming services and our digital screens don't walk into our house with their shoes on, am I right? Yeah, sometimes it's, it's, it's nicer to have your digital friends than have your actual neighbors come walking into your house. If our neighbors are loud, we can't turn them down. If our neighbors aren't interesting enough, it's not like we can just go find another show to watch. If our neighbors challenge our assumptions or say something that we disagree with, we, we, we can't let the streaming service know, I don't want to see this. <laughs> I'm not interested in this. Don't put this in my top five of things to watch. Think about all of the things that we did in the past that required real human interaction. One of my favorites was going to Blockbuster on a Friday night. Does anyone actually miss going to Blockbuster? I mean, I get the convenience of streaming a show on demand like that. I get it. I understand. But there was just something about walking into a Blockbuster, smelling the smell of whatever that smell was. I don't know. 
video ca new video cases and popcorn, right? Just last night, I was running an errand and I saw a family standing around a red box outside of a Walgreens. I didn't realize red boxes were still around, but I hate red boxes because that was one of the moves away from Blockbuster. Going to a Blockbuster on Friday night. How about going out to eat? Isn't it so much easier nowadays to bring food directly to your house? Grubhub? Um, back in 2020, at the height of the pandemic, there was that option when you ordered something from Grubhub or whatever, right? And it was this contactless delivery where it says, leave it at my door and walk away. Did anyone like that? I mean, I'll tell you what, I, I liked that back then and I like that now. And not because I'm so concerned about germs and getting sick, but because I don't want some, the person who's delivering my food to, to see me and be like, this dude at lunchtime ordered the dinner portion from the Chinese place. <laughs> yeah, just drop it off, leave it at the door. I'll come out and get it after you're gone. Thank you very much. <laughs> Shopping for groceries. Nowadays, it's so much easier to get your groceries. Someone else is doing it for you. You pull up to the, to the curbside. You got your automatic rear door opener. Don't even have to say anything to the people if you don't want to. Checking out at the grocery store, right? And although I think more people are probably wanting to go back to the old way there. Dating was something we used to have to do in person, right? I mean, nowadays there's a little more of stuff virtual. And going to church. Going to church, at least for those who are physically able to. Going to church used to be something where you didn't have as many options to say, I went to church today because... I listen to a podcast or I watch the service. No, I, I'm glad for these technologies, right? My intention isn't to burn all of it down, but to simply draw our attention to a growing unhealthy reliance on technology that disconnects us from our neighbors and our communities. We preach a good news that says that God didn't save us from afar. God didn't stand back and just snap his fingers to fix everything, even though sometimes I wish that's the way that God did things. John's gospel says that the word became flesh. We talk about this at Christmas time when we talk about Emmanuel, God with us, that the logic of God, the wisdom of God, the love of God became flesh in the person of Jesus, and he walked among us. And he dwelled with us, and he suffered with and for us, and left us a blueprint of what it looks like to live a blessed life. And that, that blueprint of, of living a blessed life is always with flesh and blood people. We can't shortcut our way to discipleship, computer chips, and our screens are incapable of living the blessed life for us or making discipleship any easier. Although there are times I want an AI hack to make being Jesus-like a little bit easier, my friends, it just doesn't and it won't exist. Think about Jesus' words in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 and how much of this centers around real, honest, difficult, and meaningful human interaction and community. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. In our relationships, being meek with one another. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Another word for, for righteousness is justice. Blessed are those who hunger for living in the ways of God's justice in this world. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers. They will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So much of that centers around real human community, relationships, and communication. And so the third factor for our anxiety, as I would suggest, would be the digitization of our relationships. And I want to close the message with this, this last one, and it's, the one that's really addressed the most in Matthew chapter 6. And it is not living in the present. Not living in the present day. Uh, Corey Ten Boom. Anyone heard of Corey Ten Boom? Wonderful author, theologian. This is what she said. 
Worrying is carrying tomorrow's load with today's strength. Carrying two days at once. It is moving into tomorrow ahead of time. Worrying doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Wow. I mean, when you get that mental image of what worrying does, it's basically you're, you're taking tomorrow, which hasn't even come yet, and you're just willingly putting it on yourself as a weight, as a burden, on top of what today has already given you. And this is hitting exactly on what Jesus says in Matthew 6 and verse 34. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. <laughs> Easier said than done, right? For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. I don't know about you, but I was thinking about my anxiety, what I feel, and I think how much of my anxiety is connected to worries about tomorrow. Tomorrow, which may not even come. And if tomorrow comes, then tomorrow will come with the permission and the blessing of our Heavenly Father who cares even for the sparrows of the air and the lilies of the field. My friends, anxiety robs us of receiving this present moment as a present or a gift. If you think about this present moment that we have right now in this place, this Sunday, May 26th, what time is it here? I won't tell you the time because it's almost time for me to end this message, but if you think about this moment that we have right here, that what, what do you have right now in this time and in this place? What blessings, what goodness surrounds you right now in this Place that maybe anxiety has robbed those thoughts from you. Jesus asks a haunting question. Can any of you, can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? I think the answer to that is probably no. We can't add time to our life with worry, but we can, we can certainly take away time from our life with our worry and our anxiety, either by distracting us from enjoying this present moment, or as we all know, there are a number of physical ailments that are directly related to the stress that comes from anxiety. And so let me, let me close with this. How can we deal with anxiety? How can we overcome anxiety? The first thing I would say is take time to power off. Take time to power off. Social media, screens, TVs, podcasts, news. When you take a Sabbath, include a digital Sabbath and make it a weekly habit for yourself. Take time to power off. Number two, take time to power up. And the way that you power up is by Christian community, regularly gathering with the saints in worship in small groups, and I would say also in mission and service outside of the church. I think the, the scriptures would say the best way that we keep engaged, we keep flexing our faith muscles, is by not neglecting the gathering of the saints. So take time to power off, take time to power up, and third, Take time to look up. Take time to look up to your heavenly Father and seeking his kingdom because that's what Jesus says at the end of the day. At the end of the day, we can worry about so much. But Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then everything else will be added to what you need to your life. And so, friends, I just want to invite you, if there's anyone today who's racked with anxiety, maybe it's, it's a daily thing, maybe it's just every once in a while, but when it creeps up, it is, it is difficult to get through. Let me, let me invite you to those things right there, power off, power up, look up. If you need to talk to someone, talk to someone that you trust, whether it's someone in the church, whether it's someone in your family, whether it's a friend, Talk about what's going on in your life because you are not, and we could say this 100% of the people in this room today could probably say that you find 
anxiety at some point during a given week? Would that be an honest thing? If you, if you would say that at least one point of my week, I feel anxious, would you raise your hand? And if there's nobody raising their hand, would you stand up? <laughs> that makes you anxious right there. All right. Now let's all stand up together, and I hope uh, we can join our voices in this. Uh, th this is just words from Philippians chapter 4. Um, let's let this be a just an affirmation of our faith. Let these words from Paul the Apostle just sink down into our spirit today. Let's join our voices. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. And the God of peace will be with you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your promise that you are the one who provides peace for us. And so there's really no secret that I can give today. There's nothing that I can sell to anyone today that... that that would make their life any better than simply receiving your peace. By looking up to you, by powering off from the distractions of this world, by powering up, by gathering with the people of God where your spirit dwells, and by looking up to you, and remembering that when we face difficulties and trials, when we face problems that are too big for us, we thank God that you are bigger than all of those things, that you hold the whole world in your hands. And so, Lord, today, for anyone who is feeling anxious, has been anxious, give them as a gift from you today your very peace. And should we wake up tomorrow, Lord, we thank you for that peace that we will find again in you. We pray these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Friends, again, if anybody would like prayer for anything today, um, if you want to come forward for prayer, you are welcome to do that. If you want to come pray with myself, um, if you want to pray with someone in the pews or go back into the prayer uh, chapel that we have, we would just love to, to make space and time for that. If you would rather just come and talk to someone throughout the week, uh, call the church, email one of the staff members. We'd love to have a conversation with you. Let's go ahead now and join our voices in this closing song.
still you came and you stepped into the dark because that's just the kind of God you are. Amen. Just a reminder, uh, we're going to have R Rita, are you here, Rita Hook? She's somewhere here, Modern Oh, she's back there. Okay, <laughs> so she's going to come forward right after this. Uh, if you're, an, if you're a member, if you just kind of have a seat for just a moment, we'll have the nominating committee hand out the ballots for our new church officers. And all you have to do is just fill that out, and then you can go after that. Um, if you're not staying around, then God bless you. Let's go ahead and close now with this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace for him. Thank you, everyone. Um, we've got the ballots here.